Today I will be discussing a topic in ME Comprehensive Evaluation Course in Algebra. At the end of this lesson, you should be able to recall the fundamental concepts and principles in algebra, list important formula and equation in algebra, and apply the concepts, principles, and formula and equations in solving coordinate problems in algebra. This will be the outline of this presentation. Let's start first with the motion problem. In algebra, problems pertaining to motion deals only with a uniform velocity. Motion problems are based on the formula distance is equals to the product of velocity and the time interval, where V again is the rate in meter per second and T is the time in second. So this formula is only applicable when our velocity is uniform. Velocity combination. Let us say that V1 is equal to the velocity of a boat or a plane and V2 is the velocity of water, current, or wind. So as you can see, the velocity of a boat or a plane will differ depending on whether it's moving with the water current or wind or whether it is also against the velocity or water of water current or wind. So if it's traveling with the wind or water, the total velocity would be equals to V1 plus V2. So it's the sum of the velocity of the boat or plane and the velocity of water current or wind. On the other hand, if it's traveling against the wind or water, the, the velocity total would be the, the velocity of the boat or plane less than the velocity of water current or wind. Because if it's traveling against the wind or water, now the velocity would be against that. So it would have to oppose that velocity, making it slower. So here is a suggested technique in solving motion problem. Step one is to draw a, a diagram to represent the relationship between the distances involved in the problem. Step two is to set up a chart based on the formula rate times time is equal to distance. Step three is to use the chart to set up one or more equations. And finally, we are going to solve the equations to find for the unknown. So let us try to apply those steps in solving sample problem number one. So we have traveled for 9 hours, and then we increased our velocity by 10 miles per hour and traveled an additional 5 hours. What was our original velocity if altogether we have traveled 750 miles? So first, we draw the diagram representing the given scenario. So this is how the diagram would look like. It is divided into two parts. First, the first part wherein we traveled for 9 hours and that is our, uh, as you can see here we have our D1 here representing that part 1. So that, uh, for that part, that is equivalent to 9 hours and we traveled here for, with a velocity of say x miles per hour. So we denote that our, we let the original velocity to be x. So this would also be the unknown in this problem. Then we have part 2 wherein we traveled a distance d2 at a time of 5 hours. Now this time our velocity has increased by 10 so that's why we have here x plus 10 miles per hour. It also stated in the problem that the sum of the part 1 and part 2, the total distance traveled is 750 miles per hour. So that's why we have our 750 miles. So next, we draw the table representing this given scenario. So this is the table. So we're going to tabulate the different parts as well as the velocity. So that's why we have velocity and we have the time and the distance. So for the velocity in part 1, it is x. For part 2, the velocity is x plus 10. So the time interval for part 1 is 9 hour. For part 2, it's 5. So therefore, we can get the distances, which is just the product of velocity and time. So that's why we have here 9x. So 9x is our d1. Then our d2 would be the product of x plus 10 and 5. So that's why we have here 5 
multiplied to x plus 10. So now that we have the table, we can set up the equation that can help us solve the value of x. So if you can look at the given scenario, we know that the sum of d1 and d2 is equal to 750 miles. So therefore, if we sum this 2s here, then we can get that equals to uh, 750, that the total distance traveled. So d1 plus d2 is equal to 750. And we know that d1 from the table is 9x and d2 is 5x plus 10. So that's why we have this one. So from that equation, we can solve for the unknown, which is our original velocity. So the original velocity is 50 miles per hour. So we have sample problem number two. We have a bicycle leaves Chicago heading east at 10 miles per hour. Three hours later, a second bicycle leaves Chicago heading east at 12 miles per hour. How long will it take for the second bicycle to overtake the first bicycle? So the diagram that would represent this scenario is this one. So we have the first bicycle that travels east at 10 miles per hour, so represented by this green arrow here. And then we have another bicycle traveling east at a velocity of 12 miles per hour. So since our first bicycle traveled uh, three hours earlier than the second, so if we denote the time for the second bicycle to be x, then the first bicycle, since it is ahead, would have a total time of x plus 3. So at that time, they will have to meet because the second bicycle will overtake the first bicycle. So from that diagram, we will set up the table and this is how it would look like. So the bicycle 1 would have a velocity of 10 miles per hour. The bicycle 2 would have 12. And then the time for the first bicycle is x plus 3 again because it travels first, meaning it's ahead. So its time is always higher than the second bicycle, which is equals to x. And now we can also multiply the velocity and time to get the equivalent distance equation. So for bicycle 1, that is 10x multiplied uh, 10 multiplied by x plus 3 and for the second bicycle that is 12x so in order for the second bicycle to overtake the first bicycle they will have the same distance so we can equate d1 is equals to d2 so d1 representing the distance for bicycle 1 and d2 for bicycle 2 so substituting the value from the table and solving for the value of x we determined the the time it would take for the second bicycle to overtake the first bicycle as 15 hours. So that means that after 15 hours, the second bicycle will be able to overtake the first bicycle. So that's 15 hours after the uh, first bicycle has traveled. Then we have another sample problem. Town A and Town B are located 55 miles apart. A jogger starts in town A and jogs toward town B. At the same time, a bicycle starts in town B and travels towards town A. The difference between the speed of the jogger and that of the bicycle is 3 miles per hour. Find the speeds if the jogger and the bicycle meets exactly 5 hours after the start. So the diagram that would represent this problem is this one. So we have the jogger, which is uh, traveling towards uh, this direction shown by this arrow here towards B and then we have the bicycle traveling towards A. So the total distance between A and B is 55 miles based on the problem. So this is how it would look like and they will meet here at this portion here based on our diagram. So from that we will draw the we'll draw the table that would represent our scenario for the jogger and for the bicycle. So if we denote the velocity of the jogger to be x, then we would have the velocity here as x for the jogger. For the bicycle, since it travels uh, 3 miles per uh, at a velocity which is 3 miles per hour higher than the jogger, 
then we'd have the velocity of the bicycle as x plus 3. Also, uh, we are given that they will meet at exactly 5 hours after the start, so the time would be the same for both the jogger and the bicycle, meaning at c is equals 5, they will meet. So that's why we have here 5 for both the jogger and the bicycle. For the distance, it's just the product of the velocity and the time. So that's why we have this. So based on our diagram, we can see that the sum of the distance of the jogger and the bicycle would equal to five, 55 miles. So the total distance traveled would be d1 plus d2 is equals to 55. So substituting the value from the table would get this equation and solving for the value of x. So x is 4 miles per hour. If you look at again our table, x is equals to the velocity of the jogger. So it's the speed of the jogger. On the other hand, for the speed of the bicycle, that is 3 more than the, the speed of the jogger. So that's why we have 4 plus 3, so that is 7 miles per hour for the speed of the bicycle. Of course, the bicycle would always be uh, faster than that of the jogger. Okay, then we have here another sample problem. The cop was chasing the crook who had 100 feet head start. The velocity of the cup was 15 feet per second while that of the crook was 11 feet per second. How long until the cup catches up with him? So the diagram that would represent this problem is this one. So we know that the crook is 100 feet ahead of the cup. So that's why we have here the original starting point of the cup and the crook has a distance of 100 feet. So that's why this is how our uh, diagram would look like and they will meet at this particular point here in order for the cup to catch the crook. So the table that would represent this problem is this one. So the velocity of the crook and the cup is given and the time would uh, we would let that to be x. So that's the unknown. So how long until the cup catches up with the uh, crook. So that's the same time for both because at that instant the cup will be able to catch the crook. So that's why we have here x. So that the distance would be equals to 11x and 15x for the crook and the cup respectively. So if you're going to look at our diagram, we can find here that 100 plus the distance of the crook would be equal to the distance traveled by the cup. So that's why we have this one. The total distance traveled would be 100 plus 11x is equals to 15x. Now we can solve for the value of x which represents the time. So, after 25 seconds, the cup catches up the crook. So, that's quite fast. Then we have another problem. So, this is a problem on velocity combination. A boat man rose to a place 4.8 miles with a stream and back in 14 hours, but finds that he can row 14 miles with a stream in the same time as 3 miles against the stream. Find the rate of the stream. So in this problem, we're given with a two scenario. The first scenario is the first sentence here, which is, A boatman rose to a place 4.8 miles with a stream and back in 14 hours. So meaning, it can go to the stream and back, which is uh, 4.8 miles apart at a time of 14 hours. And the second scenario is, it can row 14 miles to with a stream and the same time that it can go 3 miles against the stream. So the diagram that would represent the first scenario is this one. So it means that it can travel this direction back and forth which is 4.8 miles in 14 hours. So it, would, it will be able to travel uh, towards the direction of the stream and go back which is against the direction of the stream at 14 hours at the total time is 14 hours and the distance from the first point to the second point would be 4.8 miles the second scenario is represented by these two diagram first he can travel uh, towards uh, together with the stream or the current which is uh, for 14 miles in the same time that it can travel three miles uh, against the stream so the time that it would take this 14 miles and this three miles is the same 
So from that, we'll go, we will set up equations that will help us solve for the rate of the stream. So we are looking for the rate of the stream, which is the rate of the water. So we let the V1 as the velocity of the boatman and V2 as the velocity of the stream. The total time when the boat is with the stream, which is the, cur the stream current, plus uh, the total time when the boat is against the stream current is equal to 14 hours based on the first scenario. So, if we're going to total that time, it would be uh, represented by this equation. So, the time with the stream plus the time against the stream is 14 uh, hours. If we're going to represent that in terms of distance and velocity, because the time is the unknown, so the technique in solving velocity combination is we're not going to set up the equation so that the unknown uh, will be there in the equation. So we have to find a way that the unknown will be replaced by some other known variable. So that's why we replace the time since it is unknown with distance and velocity since it's given in the problem. So that's why we have here the distance over velocity which is equal to time with the stream plus the same also for against the stream which is equal to 14 hours. So if we're going to substitute the value so the distance for the first scenario is 4.8 miles. So that's why we have here 4.8 miles. It's the same for with the stream and also against the stream. So it's just going to and back. So it's the same 4.8 miles but the velocity is different so if it is with the stream the velocity would be the sum of the two velocities but if it is against the stream what would be the difference between the two so that's why we have v1 minus v2 so if we're going to rearrange that equation we will be able to arrive at this first equation so this would represent our equation one so for this problem so we'll be able to use this equation later on if we are going to find another equation in terms of v1 and v2. So for the second scenario, it is given that he can row 14 miles with a stream in the same time as 3 miles against a stream. For this case, the time it takes to row with a stream is equal to the time to row against the stream. So if we're going to equate the time, it would look like this in terms of equation. Substituting in terms of distance and velocity, it would look like this. And substituting the value now for the second scenario, the distance is equal to 14 miles if it is with the stream. And the distance is 3 miles if it is against the stream. The velocity with the stream is still V1 plus V2. The velocity against the stream is the difference. So substituting those values, so we have this equation here. Then we're going to solve it and simplify it so that we will be able to obtain equation 2. So we have the velocity of the boat in terms of the velocity of the stream. So we're going to uh, and then we are going to uh, solve the two equations simultaneously. So we can use substitution. So we substitute equation 2 to equation 1 so that this is how our equation would look like. So it, this is now our uh, equation as you can see the only unknown is the rate of the stream which is v2 so solving that we can get the velocity of the stream as 0 0.76 miles per hour so if you can see we can round it off to 0 0.8 miles per hour so in some sub problems in the board exam the, the the final answer is already a round off value so that's why we have this is an example of that case so we were able to understand further the motion problem. So now we are ready to deal with the work problem. Work problems have direct real-life applications. Some problems involve number of persons working as well as pipes filling a tank. Say for example, you are a contractor or you are an, a foreman or an engineer and you are looking for the number of people that would be required to do a particular engineering work then in order to uh, justify the number of people you may use the work uh, problem equations so we have three cases 
that we can use. First case 1 is the total man hour to complete the work. It's equal to the sum of the unit man hour. For example, you have 150 man hour to build the house or 1750 man are required to build the house and that's equals to the the sum of the individual man hours for civil works, electrical works and mechanical works as you can see. The second case is the sum of unit work which is equal to the total unit work. So say for example, you have the time it takes for person A, person B and person C represented by T1, T2 and T3 is known. Then you can get that time that would that will uh, they will be able to finish the work together represented by this letter T here. So again, T is a time that worker 1, 2, and 3 each can do the job alone. And the big letter T is the total time that worker can finish the job if all of them work together. And then we have case 3, the work, unit work, time of work done. So say for example, you know the time that one worker 1, worker 2, and worker 3 will be able to do the work together and also the time where XYZ will work together then you can solve also the value of that by using this work unit time work of done equation. So T1, T2, T3, XYZ represents the time that each person can do the job alone. TA and TB is the time that they will be able to finish the work if they work together. So, let's so this is a suggested technique in solving work problem. First, a problem involving work can be solved using the appropriate formula depending on the case that is presented in the previous slide. Solve the equation created in the first step. This can be done by first multiplying the entire problem by the common denominator and then solving the resulting equation. Then you're going to answer the question as of you in the problem and be sure to include units in your answer. So say we have here, it takes Randy four hours to paint a room. It takes Cecil six hours to paint the same room. How long does it take for them to paint the room together? So if they work together, how long would it take for them to finish the work? So from our case two, which is the sum of unit work, which is equal to the total unit of work, this is our working equation. And since we know the time that it would take for Randy and Cecil, we substitute those values in the equation. So the time are 6 hours and 4 hours respectively. So our time that it would take for them to paint the room together would be 2.4 hours. So you're going to check if your answer makes sense. So if you're going to check it, so that total time now would be reduced to 2.4 hours from the original 6 hours and 4 hours if to do the work alone. So it's better for them to work together because they were able to reduce the time that it would take to paint the room. So it makes sense. A swimming pool can be filled by three water pipes, A, B, and C. Pipe A alone can fill the pool in 8 hours. Pipe B alone can fill the, uh, the pool in 10 hours. And pipe C can fill it in 12 hours. How long does it take to fill the swimming pool using all three pipes? So this is still case number 2 because we are given with the sum of the unit work which equals to the total unit of work. And this is our working equations in terms of the time that it would take for each of the pipes to fill the pool, A, B, and C respectively. Substituting the value from the given, we can find and solve for the value of the time it takes for them to work together to fill the swimming pool. So the time is 3.24 hours. So as you can see, the time is reduced from 8, 10, 12 hours to 3.24 hours if all of the pipe are used to fill the swimming pool. So the answer also makes sense. Anne can paint her room in 10 hours. If Anne and Brittany work together, it takes 6 hours to paint the room. How long would it take for Brittany to paint the room alone? So in this problem, we're still given with the time that it would take. But this time, we're given with the total time if they work together as well. So this is still an application of case number 2. But this time, we are looking for the time that it would take for Brittany to paint the room alone. So our equation would look like this still. But we are given with the total time t and also the time that it would take for Anne to work. 
So that our unknown is a time for Britney to paint the room alone, which is represented by uh, TB here in our equation. So solving for TB, we can get 15 hours. So it means that Britney can paint the room alone in 15 hours. But if Anne and Britney will work together, they can finish it in 6 hours. Then we have a swimming pool which can fill by a water pipe in 8 hours and can be emptied by another pipe in 10 hours. One night when the pool is empty, we accidentally leave both pipes open. How long will it take for the pool to be filled with water? So in this problem, we are given with the time but the time is has different uh, application. The first time is to fill while well, the second time is to empty. So if that's the case, what we're going to do is to still use case number two since we're given with the sum of unit work, but we denote the the other value as negative. So that's why we have the second pipe, which is working opposite the first, it will be denoted by the negative sign. So the, the, our equation would look like this. So our uh, water pipe, which is which can fill in eight hours, would be positive. And the other one, which can empty, we denote that as negative since they have opposite uh, purpose. So the total time for the pool to be filled with water is 40 hours. So it would mean that even if the one pipe is emptying it, but because there is a pipe that's trying to fill it, the pool can still be filled, but the time would be after 40 hours. So sample problem number 10, Andy and Lillian together clean their house in 6 hours. Working alone, it takes Andy 5 hours longer to clean the house than for Lillian. How long does it take for Andy to clean the house alone? So in this problem, we are still given with each of the unit work so we can still use the equation for case number 2. But this time, the time that it would take for and D to work is given in terms of the time that it would take for Lillian to work. And that is 5 hours longer than that for Lillian. So if the time that it would take for Lillian is TL, then the time that it would take for Andy is TL plus 5. So if you substitute that in our equation, it would look like this. So for Andy, it's TL plus 5. For Lillian, it's TL. And the total time, if they work together, is 6 hours based on the problem. So we are looking for the time that it would take for Andy. But since we have here TL, we will be able to solve first for the time that it would take for Lillian. So the time that it would take for Lillian to work, to clean the house, would be 10 hours. And now we know that the time that it would take for Andy is six is 5 hours more than that of Lillian. So we just add 5 to that value and we can get the time that it would take for Andy to clean the house. So here we'll, if we're able to verify that Andy works slower than that of Lillian, which is uh, 10 hours. So now that we know how to solve work problems using the different cases, now we are going to have the clock problem. A clock problem is a mathematical problem which focus on the relationship of tile movements of the hands, the hour hand, minute hand, second hand of the clock. This type of problem is our for mechanical clocks only and never for a digital clocks. So when we say mechanical clocks, this is how it would look like as you can see in the presentation. So the basis for analysis in clock is if we say x be the number of minute spaces the minute hand will rotate around the clock, for every x travel of the minute hand, the hour hand would travel x over 12 minute spaces. The second hand and the other hand would travel 60x. So it would means that the second hand is really faster compared to the, at the hour hand because the hour hand is x over 12 if for every x travel of the minute hand is represented by x. Other modifiers of the position of the hands of the clock are for the hands to be 90 degrees they are 15 minute spaces from each other. For the hands to be opposite each other, they have to be 30 minute spaces. So we'll be able to use this uh, concepts later on in solving clock problem. So 
So let us apply that in this sample problem. In how many minutes after 7 o'clock will the hands of the clock be directly opposite to each other for the first time? For this kind of problem, if you're going to find the minute time represented by x, if they are to be directly opposite, the shortcut is to multiply the opposite time by 60 over 11. So here we are given with 7 o'clock and we are looking for the time that they will be opposite each other after 7 o'clock. And the opposite of 7 in our clock is 1 o'clock. So we are going to multiply 1 o'clock with 60 over 11. And that would be that the minute that they will be directly opposite each other for the first time. So that the minute is 5.454 minutes. So after 5.454 minutes, the hands of the clock will be directly opposite to each other for the first time after 7 o'clock. At what time between 4 and 5 o'clock will the hands of a clock coincide? So it means that they are together. So to find the minute time that they are co coincide each other or they will be together, we multiply the lower given time by 60 over 11. So the lower given time is 4 o'clock. So the, we multiply that with 60 over 11, so the minute would be 21.81 minutes. So that means that if we convert this minute to the equivalent uh, minutes and seconds, so we can obtain this value. That is, after 4 o'clock, 21 minutes, and 49 seconds, they will be uh, together, or do will, the hands of the clock will, be, will coincide to each other. At what time between 10 and 11 o'clock will the minute and the hour hand be at right angles? To find the minute if right angle, we count 15 minutes from the lower hour and multiply the result by 60 over 11. So the lower given time is 10 o'clock. So we count 15 minutes from 10 o'clock, we have 1 o'clock. Thus, if we multiply 1 o'clock by 10, by 60 over 11, we can get 5.45. So if we convert 5.45 minutes to the equivalent minutes and seconds, that would be equals to 5 minutes and 27 seconds. Therefore, they will be at right angles at after 10 o'clock, 5 minutes and 27 seconds. What is the angle between the minute hand and the hour hand of a clock when the time is 4.20? So this is represented, this hour 4.20 can be represented in the clock in this figure here. So we can see here that the hour hand is the smaller one and the minute hand is represented by this larger arrow here which is pointing at uh, 4 which is equivalent to 20 minutes in our clock. So that's 5, 10, 15, 20. So, that's, so this time would represent 4, 20. And we are looking for the angle between this hour hand and this minute hand. So we know that one minute spaces in our clock is equal to 6 degrees because one hour is equal to 60 minutes. And the whole clock is equivalent to 360 degrees. So therefore, one minute is equals to six degrees. So if uh, we also know that the minute space between the hour hand and the minute hand is x over 12, because uh, based on our theory a while ago, that if the minute hand has traveled x, as you can see here, it has traveled the distance x, the hour hand will travel an equivalent a distance of x over 12 around this clock. So from the figure, our x is equal to 20 minutes. If you're going to count it because we have here 5, 10, 15, 20. So our x is exactly 20 minutes. Thus, our x over 12 is equal to 20 over 12 minutes. So what we're going to do, since this 20 over 12 minutes is equivalent to this angle here, we will 
convert it to degrees by multiplying it with the conversion factor that is 6 degrees is equals to 1 minute. Therefore, the angle between the minute hand and the hour hand at 420 is 10 degrees. The angle between the minute hand and the hour hand of a clock when the time is 330. So this is how it would look like. So we have the hour hand pointing at this uh, arrow here with a smaller one. And then we have the minute hand pointing at 6 since it's at 330. So that is 30 minutes past the hour of 3 o'clock. So if we're going to observe our figure, our minute hand has traveled X. So and at the same time, our hour hand has traveled X over 12 from the position 3, which is the 3 o'clock position. So we know that every 1 minute is equal to 6 degrees. And by inspection, the angle between the hands of the clock is 90 degrees. So if you're going to observe it, the angle between 6 and 3 is 90 degrees. So we, if we are going to, to compute the value of x over 12, then we will be able to get the angle here. We just subtract this x over 12 equivalent to degrees from 90 degrees. So we just minus the equivalent x over 12 minutes. We know that x is 30 minutes from our observation here. So since it's pointing at 6, meaning the minute is already 30 minutes. Thus, our x over 12 is 30 over 12 minutes. So we convert that to degrees by multiplying it with our factor that's 15 degrees. So therefore, the angle between this 3 o'clock and this smaller arrow here would be 15 degrees. And we know that the angle between 6 and 3 is 90. So we just subtract 90 degrees. Uh, we just subtract 15 degrees from 90 degrees. So the angle between the hour hand and the minute hand for this case is 75 degrees. So now that we have an idea how to solve clock, clock problem, we, were, we are now ready to proceed to the age problem. So for the age problem, Please take note that the number of years past is equivalent to the present age minus the past age. Also, the number of years to come is equal to the future age minus the present age. So the technique in solving age problem is to assume the present age to be the difference and just use positive if the age referred is future and negative if the age referred to is past. So this is the structure of the age table that will help us solve age problem. So we are going to list the person A and person B and also their present age and also the change in their ages. So let us try to use also these steps here in solving age problem. First, we're going to fill in the now column. The person we know nothing about is X. So we're going to denote the age of the person that we know nothing about as X. We fill in the future past column by adding or subtracting the change to the now column. We make an equation for the relationship in the future. This is independent of the table. We replace the variables in equation with information in future cell of tables. We solve the value or the equation for x. Use the solution to answer the question. Adam is 20 years younger than Brian. In two years, Brian will be twice as old as Adam. How old are they now? So we let x be the age of Brian now, since that is the information that we do not know anything about, while Adam is 20 years younger than Brian based on the problem. So when we set up the table for the age now, we can find here that the age of Brian, if we let that x, then the age of Adam would be x minus 20, because Adam is 20 years younger than Brian, which is X years old now. It's given that in two years, which is the future, Brian will be twice as old as Adam. So for the future, which is two years from now, we will add two for their age, which is their age now. So if we add two from X minus 20, the age in the future would be X minus 18. 
for the age of Brian, that would be x plus 2. So, we will use this table in solving for the age of Brian. So, using the idea that in 2 years, Brian will be twice as old as Adam, we can set up the equation as the age of Brian in 2 years would be equals to twice the age of Adam in 2 years. So, their age in 2 years is already found in the table. So, if we substitute that value here, we can get the value of x which is the age of Brian. So, the age of Brian is 38. Since Adam is 20 years younger than Brian, then we will just subtract that value from the age of Brian now. So, the age of Adam is 18 years. So, the age of Adam is 18 years old while the age of Brian is 38 years old now. Armen is 12 years older than David. Five years ago, the sum of their ages was 28. How old are they now? So we let x be the age of David now, since that is the, the age that we do not have any idea based on the problem. Well, Carmen is given as 12 years older than David. So if we set up our table, it would look like this. For the age now, if we let x be the age of David, the, uh, the age of Carmen would be x plus 12 because Carmen is 12 years older than David. In the problem, we are also given where their, with their age 5 years ago. So, we take that as negative 5. So, we subtract negative 5 from their age now so that we can find their age in the past. So, their age in the past would be for Carmen, that is x plus 12 minus 5. While for David, that is, that is x minus 5. So, we set up the equation based on the sentence which says that 5 years ago, the sum of their ages is 28. So, if we sum their age 5 years ago, that would be equal to 28. So, substituting the value from the table based on the past... And solving for the value of x, we'll be able to solve the age of David. So the age of David now is 13. On the other hand, the age of Carmen, which is 12 years older than David, is 25. The sum of the ages of Nicole and Christine is 32. In two years, Nicole will be three times as old as Christine. How old are they now? So in this problem, we let x be the age of Nicole since there's no information about the age of Nicole. And we let the age of Christine as 32 minus x now. Since it's given in the problem that the sum of the ages of Nicole and Christine is 32. So if the age of Nicole is x, then that would mean that the age of Christine has to be 32 minus x. So if we set up the table, the age of Nicole and the age of Christine is shown in the first table. It's also given that in two years, Nicole will be three times as old as Christine. So we set up first the table for the future by adding two in their ages now. Then, from the sentence, in two years, Nicole will be three times as old as Christine we will be able to obtain this in relationship between the age of Nicole and the age of Christine in the future. Substituting the value from the table in the future and solving for the value of x, which is the age of Nicole, then the age of Nicole is 25. And we know that the age of Christine is 32 minus the age of Nicole. So the age of Christine now is 7. So if we're going to verify... If our answer is correct, we add 25 and 7, the answer would be 32. So the sum of the ages of Nicole and Christine is indeed 32. We are able to practice and understand how to solve the age problem. We are now ready to move forward to the mixture problem. In the mixture problem, we have this what we call 
the quantity analysis, and the composition analysis. The value A, B, and C here are the number of quantities by volume or weight. On the other hand, X, Y, and Z represents the unit cost or the fractional parts of each quantity A, B, and C. So let's try to apply this idea in this example. How many gallons of 3% acid solution must be mixed with 60 gallons of 10% acid solution to obtain an acid solution that is 8%? So here we are going to mix the 60 gallon 10% acid solution with the unknown gallons of 3% acid solution. And the product would be an acid solution that is 8%. So if we're going to write the quantity analysis, it would look like this. So we have A, which represents the number of gallons for 3% acid solution, plus 60 gallons of 10% acid solution is equals to C, which represents the sum of the total gallons for the 3% and the 10% acid solution respectively. That would be our first equation. In the composition analysis, we're going to multiply each of this quantity with the equivalent percentages. So A is 3% acid solution, while 60 gallon is 10% acid solution. The product is C, which is 8% uh, acid solution based on our given problem. So the next step would be to substitute equation 1 to equation 2. So if we substitute, we will find that the only unknown would be the value of A, which is the number of gallons of the 3% acid solution, and that is 24 gallon. So here, we need 24 gallon of 3% acid solution to be mixed with a 10% of the 60 gallon acid solution to obtain a total of 84 gallons of the 8% acid solution. How much water would be added to 20 gallon of 15% acid solution to dilute it to a concentration of 12%? So here we're given with the quantities A, which is the unknown, which is the water, that should be added to the 20 gallons, which is our B, so that we can obtain C, which is also unknown in the problem, which is 12% in concentration. So that would be our equation one. For the composition analysis, we multiply each of these with the percentages of the acid solution. Since water is 0% acid, since it's pure water, so the percentage for A would be zero. For B, which is 20 gallon, it's given as 15% acid solution. The product concentration would be 12%. So, substituting equation 1 to equation 2, and then solving for the unknown, which is A, we can get 5 gallons of water that needed to be added to 20 gallons of 15% acid solution in order to obtain a total of 20 plus 5 or 25 gallons of 12% concentration. An alloy containing 30% silver is mixed with a 55% silver alloy to get 80 pounds of 40% alloy. How much of the 30% silver alloy must be used? So for the quantity analysis, we have A and B which are unknown, which is the A representing the alloy containing 30% silver and B representing the alloy containing 55% silver to obtain the result which is 80 pounds of the 40% alloy. For the composition analysis, we multiply each of the quantity with the risk corresponding percentages. Then we substitute equation 1 to equation 2 and uh, first we have to rearrange the equation 1 so that the result would be in terms of A. So we can solve the value of A as 480 pounds. Since we are looking for the 30% silver alloy, and that is our A. So it would mean that we need 480 pounds of the 30% silver alloy added to the 
800 minus 480 pounds of 55% silver alloy to get 800 pounds of the 40% alloy. So we're able to know how to solve mixture problem. We are now ready to embark with a digit problem. So the basis for analysis is this. For two digit number, we can represent the digit, pro digit to be 10t plus u. It, that is our original number. T here represents the 10 uh, place and U is the unit place. For the reverse number of a two-digit number, it would look like 10U plus T. For a three-digit number, it would look like 100H plus 10T plus U as the original number and the reverse would be 100U plus 10T plus H. So again, U is the unit H, a uh, unit digit, T is the tens digit, and H is the hundreds digit. So let us have an example. The sum of the digits in a two-digit number is 11. If we interchange the digits in the number, we obtain a new number that is 27 less than the original number. Find this number. So if you're going, if the board exam gives you the given, it would be very handy if we solve uh, digit problems using reversed engineering. So we're going to look at the choices and we're going to check if it satisfies the condition in the problem. So it's given that the sum of the digit is 11. So if you're going to look at the choices, the only number here which has the sum of digits as 11 is 74 because 7 plus 4 is 11. So that's the perks if a digit problem comes out in the board exam. So you can use reverse engineering. But for the sake of solution, so this is a two-digit number. So we represent the original number and the reverse number using the equation that you can see here. So the sum of the digits and the two-digit number is 11. So that means that our t plus u is equals to 11. So therefore, our t is equals to 11 minus u. So that would be our first equation. If we interchange the digit in the number, we obtain a new number that is 27 less than the original number. So if we use the difference between the reverse and the original number, it should be equal to 27 based on the problem. So the equation would look like 10t plus u minus the quantity 10u plus t would be equals to 27. So it's just the original minus the reverse is equal to 27. So we substitute equation 1 to equation 2 and solve for the number that we can get. So u would be the uh, variable that is unknown here. So u is equal to 4. So if we solve for the value of t, that's just 11 minus 4. So that is 7. So if we we'll plug in that to our two-digit number original number equation, which is 10t plus u, so that would be equals to 74. So it verifies our reverse engineering solution. So we have here another problem. The ones digit in a two-digit number is three less than the tens digit. If we interchange the digits in the number and add this new number to the original number, the sum is 11. Find this number. So for a two-digit number, we can represent their digits in this format. So the ones digit in a two-digit number is three less than the tens digit. So we can represent that in the equation u is equal to 10 uh, t minus 3. If we interchange the digits in the number and add this new number to the original number, the sum would be 77. So it would mean that the original plus the reverse is equal to 77. So we substitute 1 to 2 and solve for the value that is unknown, which is t. So t would be equal to 5. So since t is equal to 5, we can also solve for the value of u, which is just 5 minus 3, and that is 2. So if we substitute that in our uh, equation for the original number, the original number is equal to 52. So the original number here is 52. If we verify that, we can find that it's correct. So the ones digit in the two-digit number is 3 less than the tens digit. So that's 5 minus 2 is equal to 3. And the sum of 5 and 2 is 
a uh, 7. So let's proceed to the law of exponents. So here are the laws of exponents. So we'll be able to use each of these law when solving problems involving laws of exponents. So say for example, if you want to simplify a complex uh, fraction, just like what you can see here in the presentation. So we're given with that complex equation, what we're going to do first is to distribute the exponent of each quantity in the parentheses. So using the law of exponent, we simply multiply each of the exponent of each variable to the outside exponent. So we have this resulting one. And then from that, we're going to add the exponent of similar base in the numerator. So our equation would be uh, transformed into this equation that you can see here. And then we're going to perform division of like terms by subtracting the exponent of denominator from the numerator, obtaining this one. So our result would be equals to 1 over x squared plus y to the power of z multiplied by z to the power of 3. Another one, we solve for the value of x. So in this problem, we can solve this actually by using scientific calculator for three unknowns. So you can follow this link found in this presentation for a step-by-step -step procedure in solving this one. So the answer should be equals to 2. So we have here another problem. We are going to evaluate y is equals to this equation here. So we expand the terms in each quantity in the numerator. We cancel out 5 to the power of 2n and solve the remaining numbers. So the value would be equals to 9. Then we have to give the factors of a squared minus x squared. So using factoring method, we know that x plus y multiplied by x minus y is equals to the square, the difference of the squares. So if we substitute a and x, we can still obtain the same results. So now that we know how to solve problems involving law of exponents, we are now ready to proceed with the properties of logarithm. So this property of logarithm that you can find here, will help us to solve and evaluate for the value of the variable y, the base b, and the x. And that y is equal to log x to the base b is equal to the base b to the power of y is equal to x. So these are the laws involving logarithms. So we can uh, multiply them, we can divide, we can also raise them to a certain power using the power rule. We can also change the base and also we can also find equality rule. So we have here if lag 10 to the base a is equals to 0 0.25, what is the value of lag a to the base 10? So if lag 10 to the base a is equals to 0 0.25, we can write this in the equivalent a, which is the base raised to the power of 0 0.25 is equals to 10. From that, we can solve the value of A. We can use calculator. So A is equal to 10,000. So if we use this value of A in like A to the base 10, then we can solve for the value of that, and that is equal to 4. What expression is equivalent to like x minus like y plus z? So using the quotient rule, like x minus like quantity of y plus z is equal to like the quotient of x and y plus z. Find the value of x if lag x to the base 12 is equal to 2. So if lag x to the, bar, to, the, to the base 12 is equal to 2, then it is equivalent to x is equal to 12 squared. So x is equal to 144. Now let's proceed to progression. So progression be arithmetic progression, geometric progression, and we also have infinite progression. So for arithmetic progression, 
we can find the nth term using this formula here. The sum of all terms using these two equations where the common difference represented by d is equals to a2 minus am. The arithmetic mean would be equals to am plus a3 over 2. Take note that, say for example, arithmetic progression will have an, an equivalent uh, form just like this, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So if you can look at it, the common difference is constant. So arithmetic progression is a sequence of numbers called terms, each of which after the first term is derived from the preceding one by adding to it a fixed number called the common difference. So the common difference here is fixed. So for the example 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, that is equal to 2. So we find the 30th term of the arithmetic progression 4, 7, 10, and so on and so forth. So using the formula that you can find here, where AM is equal to 4, that's the first number. M is equal to 1, the position of the first number. N is 30, that's the unknown term, the last term. D is the common difference and it's equal to 3. So our 30th term is equal to 91. A stack of bricks has 61 bricks in the bottom layer, 58 bricks in the second layer, 55 bricks in the third layer, and so on, until there are 10 bricks in the last layer. How many bricks are there? So this is an arithmetic progression also because there is a common difference of 3. So our AM is 61, that's the first number. Our M is equals to 1, that is the position of the first number. Our D is equal to 58 minus 61, that is negative 3, that's the common difference, because as you can see, it's decreasing. So our sum is, is, is equal to, can be solved again using these two equations. Equating the two equations, we can find that the value of N is equal to 18. And finally, the sum is 639. So there are 639 bricks all in all. Once a month, a man puts some money into the cookie jar. Each month, he put 50 centavos more into the jar than the previous month. After 12 years, he counted his money. He paid. He had 5,436 pesos. How much did he put in the jar in the last month? The total number of months is 12 times 12, and that is 144. So n would be 144, the number of sequence. d would be 50, that's the common difference. s is the sum, which is 5,436. Thus, we can use the formula in terms of the sum and solve for the value of am. So am is equal to 2. And substituting that to the first equation, which is the equation of S, we can get AN. So the money that he put in the jar in the last month as 73.5. Let's proceed to the geometric progression. For finding the M term, we can use this formula. For the sum of all terms, we have two equations. We can use if the common ratio is less than 1, we would use the first one. If it is greater than 1, we can use the second equation. The geometric mean is equal to the square root of A1 and A3. Again, the common ratio R there is the A2 over AM. For example, we have 2, 4, 8, and 16. So as you can see, if we are going to look at it, there's no common difference because the difference between the succeeding is not the same. Therefore, it is a geometric progression because the co there's a common ratio. So if we divide 4 by 2, that is equals to 2. If we divide 8 by 4, that's equals to 2. 16 divided by 8 is still 2. The common ratio here is 2. So geometric progression is a sequence of numbers called terms, each of which, which after the first term is obtained by multiplying the preceding term by a fixed number called the common ratio. So therefore, we obtain 4 by multiplying 2 by 2. We obtain 8 by multiplying 4 by 2. 
we we obtain 16 by multiplying 8 by 2, and so on and so forth. Find the sum of the first 10 terms of the geometric progression 2, 4, 8, 16. So for this problem, since we're looking for the sum, if you're going to observe, the common ratio is greater than 1 because 4 divided by 2 is equal to 2 and that is greater than 1. So we use the first equation in terms of the sum of terms. So in this equation, our r is equal to 2. Again, that is the diff, that is the quotient of the second and the first. We can also use the third and the second or the fourth and the third and so on and so forth. So the common ratio is 2. Our AM is equal to 2, that's the first term. Our N is equal to 10, that is the number of terms required. So our sum would be equal to 2,046 if we substitute all of those values. Find the geometric mean of 64 and 4. So, so the geometric mean is just the square root of the two uh, numbers or in the geometric sequence and that is equals to 16 here in this example then we have the infinite progression for the infinite progression we can solve the sum using this equation here so find the sum of the infinite progression 6 negative 2 2 third so if we use the formula we know that our first term is equals to 6 the common ratio is negative 2 over 6. That's the second divided by the first. Substituting the sum of this infinite geometric progression is simply 4.5. Find the ratio of the infinite geometric series if the sum is 2 and the first term is 1 half. So the formula is shown here. The sum is equal to 2. The first term is 1 half. Then we can solve for the ratio as 0 0.75. Now let's proceed to the quadratic equation. The general quadratic equation is represented by this equation that you can see here. The quadratic formula is used to solve the roots in terms of the coefficients of the different terms. The nature of the roots, on the other hand, can also be known by using the discriminant. So if the discriminant is equal to 0, we will have real and equal roots. If it is greater than 0, then we have real and unequal roots. If it is less than 0, then it's, we will have imaginary or complex roots. So find the value of x in the equation. So we can see that it's a quadratic equation. Then we can use the quadratic formula. So we just substitute simply the value of a, b, and c. So our a is equal to 24. That's the coefficient of x squared. Our b is equal to 5. That's the coefficient of x. And the constant negative 1 is equal to c. So our value of x, if we solve that, um, equation is 1 8 and negative 1 third. So there are two roots always in a quadratic equation. So here we have 1 8 and negative 1 third. Find the value of k of the equation. So using a discriminant, we know that b squared minus 4ac. So if we substitute the value, our b squared is equals to 4 multiplied by a, which is 1, the coefficient of our x squared, and then c is equal to 4, the coefficient of the constant. So our value of b is positive negative 4, and that is also equals to our k. If the roots of the equations are 1 and 1 and 2, what is the quadratic equation? We can simply find the quadratic equation by uh, substituting the equivalent factors of the roots. And since we have positive roots, then it can be written as x minus 1 multiplied by x minus 2. Expanding the equation, we can find the quadratic equation to be x squared minus 3x plus 2. 
Now, let's proceed to the Factor Theorem. The Factor Theorem states that if x minus r is a factor of a function of x, then r is a root of the function of x is equal to 0. Say, we have here an example. Find the value of k for which x plus 4 is a factor of x cubed plus 2x squared minus 7x plus k. Using the factor theorem, if x cubed plus 2x squared minus 7x plus k is equal to 0, and if x plus 4 is equal to 0 is a factor, then substituting this value of x to the given equation and solving for k, we obtain this one. So we solve for the, we know that x is equal to negative 4 from the factor x plus 4. So we substitute this into that equation and solve for the value of k. So our k is equals to 4. So that's the use of the factor at theorem. Then let's proceed to the remainder theorem. If f of x is divided by x minus r, the remainder is f of r. Find the remainder when x to the power of 4 minus 10x squared minus 9x minus 20 is divided by x minus 4. Using the remainder theorem, substituting the value of one of the roots x minus 4 to the equation x to the power of 4 minus 10x squared minus 9x minus 20, where x is equal to 4 from the x minus 4. If we substitute that value of x to the given equation, then our remainder would be 40. Finally, we have the binomial theorem. So, in the expansion x plus y to the power of n, the first term there is x to the power of n always. The last term will always have y to the power of n. The exponent of the x decreases by 1. The exponent of y increases by 1. The sum of the exponent of each term is equal to n. The number of terms is equal to n plus 1. And the coefficients of the symmetrical terms are equal. The binomial formula is a useful formula that will help us to solve for the various coefficients of the terms. So a is the coefficient of the previous term, b is the exponent of x of the previous term, c is the exponent of y of the previous term. The on the other hand is the coefficient of the next term. So if you are looking for the coefficient of the next term, then we can use this binomial formula by substituting the value of a, b, and c. If you want to look for the r to the r yet term, then it's just, it can be solved using this formula here. n combination r minus 1 multiplied by x to the power of n minus the quantity r minus 1 multiplied by y to the power of r minus 1. Where r is the power of the term and n is the power of the binomial. Say for example, find the sixth term of the expansion. 1 over 2a minus 3 to the power of 16. So if we're going to expand this term, what would be the sixth term in the expansion? So take note that if we expand this manually, it would be very difficult since it's raised to the power of 16, meaning you have to multiply itself to its 16 times. So we will use the shortcut formula, which is n combination r minus 1 x to the power of n minus r minus 1 multiplied by y minus to the power of r minus 1. So we are given with this uh, expression. So uh, in that expression, if we substitute that in our formula, our n there is equals to 16. Our r is the r at term, which is 6. Then our x there is the first term, which is 1 minus 2a. Our uh, y, on the other hand, is the negative 3. That's why we have here negative 3. So we just substitute all of those values all together in that formula so that we can obtain the sixth term as negative 66,339 over 128a to the power of 11.
the term involving y to the power of r term. Say, for example, you are looking for the term that's, that contains that y to the power of r. Then we can use this formula instead. Say, for example, we are going to find the term involving x to the power of 6 in the expansion of x squared plus 1 over x to the power of 12. So we, will, we are going to use our formula where our n is equal to 12, our r is equal to 6, our x is equal to the first term, which is x squared, our y in this formula is equal to 1 over x. So substituting those values and then solving, we can find that the term involving x to the power of 6 is the 924x to the power of 6. So as you can see, it contains the term x to the power of 6. For the sum of exponents, the sum of coefficients, the sum of coefficients if the second term is constant for a binomial expansion, we can use each of these formula here. Say for example, what is the sum of the exponents of the expansion x plus 2y to the power of 14? Using the formula n multiplied by n plus 1 where n is equal to 14, then we can get that the sum of the exponents of the expansion would be 210. Meaning, if you expand this term, the sum of all the exponents would be 210. What is the sum of the coefficients of the expansion x plus 2y to the power of 4? So, for the sum of the coefficients, you can use this formula. The coefficient of x plus the coefficient of y to the power of n. So, we just substitute the coefficient of x, which is 1, the coefficients of y, which is 2, and we raise that to the power of n so that we can obtain the sum of the coefficients as 8, 1. What is the sum of the coefficient of the expansion 2x minus 1 to the power of 3? As you can see, our second term here is a constant, so we can use this formula. So if we substitute the value from the given, then the sum of the coefficients would be equal to 2. So in this lesson, we were able to refresh our understanding on the motion problem work problem, clock problem, age problem, mixture problem, digit problem, law of exponents, properties of logarithm, progression, quadratic equation, factor theorem, remainder theorem, and the binomial theorem.